Welcome to One Symphony, a podcast that explores classical music's relevance in our modern lives. I'm conductor Devin Patrick Hughes, and I'm here to share with you stories and conversations with musicians, composers, and artistic entrepreneurs that aim to unite us into one symphonic world. Earning widespread notice for his richly colored and superbly crafted scores, Pierre Jalbert's music has been described as immediately capturing one's attention with its strong gesture and vitality by the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Among his many honors are the Rome Prize, the BBC Master Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Fromm Foundation Commission. Jalbert's music has been performed worldwide in such venues as Carnegie Hall, Wigmore Hall, Lincoln Center, the Kennedy Center, and the Barbican. Recent orchestral performances include those by the Boston Symphony, the National Symphony, the Houston Symphony, the Cabrillo Festival Orchestra, and the Cincinnati Symphony. He has served as composer in residence with the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, the California Symphony, and Music in the Loft in Chicago. Select chamber music commissions and performances include those of the Ying, Borromeo, Maya, Enso, Chiara, Escher, Del Sol, and Emerson String Quartets, as well as the violinist Midori. Three new CDs of his music have been recently released, the Violin Concerto, Piano Quintet and Secret Alchemy, and the Piano Trio No. 2. Jalbert is Professor of Music at Rice University's Shepherd School of Music in Houston, and he is a co-founder of Musica, a Houston-based new music collective. That's spelled M-U-S-I-Q-A. His music is published by Schott Helicon Music Corporation in New York. Pierre, it's so great to have you on One Symphony today. I'm looking forward to speaking with you about your incredibly uplifting and mystical and spiritual music. The first question I wanted to ask just gets into your background. You started playing piano at the age of five. You also played some percussion and cello. You have this English and French tradition growing up in Vermont, but being from Quebec. You talk about your connection to the Catholic liturgical music, this sort of plain chant. And to me, your music has this kind of recurring theme of spirituality. I would just love to hear about your background and how you discovered that voice. Growing up in Vermont, I was born in New Hampshire, by the way, but I spent all of my youth in Vermont, which I still love and still consider a home. Hearing Gregorian chant, I think early on was a big influence. There's something about that music, especially the unison singing in a very large reverberant space that has such an impact to it. Resonance and reverberation play a big role in my music too. So I think that's one of the places it comes from. I also studied with this wonderful American composer, George Crumb, mm -hmm. where resonance and reverberations also play a huge role too, of course. So there's that big influence. In terms of the folk music background too, I played piano from an early age and was very much raised in the classical tradition. Every year, my whole extended family got together and we'd sit around and sing American and French Canadian folk songs. And some of those French Canadian folk songs eventually made their way into my music as well as the American ones. They would all bring their guitars and very few of them studied music formally, but everybody played by ear. That was a huge influence growing up too. So it's sort of the confluence of all of these different experiences, I think, that led to where I am in terms of my voice right now. In addition to George Crumb, for instance, you recount a story about connecting with Aaron Copeland at the beginning of your life and thinking that that guy's writing and he's making a living doing it. How did you make that pivot from, okay, this is great to come home to and be around family and play for the holidays to actually, I need to create music for a living? Neither one of my parents were musicians. It really came from, on my father's side, his brothers and sisters all played 
either guitar or piano, but just by year, just by picking it up, they never studied formally. I was a pianist my whole life, but I also studied percussion instruments so that I could play in the school band and the school orchestra growing up. One of the composers we played once in a while was Darren Copeland, and I eventually came to really love his music and eventually found out he was still living and still around at that time. And I actually wrote him a letter and got something back in the mail, which was great. I knew that he was one of those few composers who was actually making a living writing concert music. And of course, he also did film music and other types of things too. And eventually I stayed at the Aaron Copeland house, which has its own foundation just north of New York in Cortland Manor. Copeland's last home was left as a place for composers to go one at a time and use the house as a residence to work on a project. There's a Copeland House Ensemble now that plays living composers. It's a really wonderful legacy, I think, to have left. One of your pieces, I think about 10 years ago, Secret Alchemy, was that created out of this Copeland Ensemble? Yeah, they recorded a CD. Originally, that piece was commissioned by the Arizona Friends of Chamber Music, but the Copeland Ensemble did a whole series of my works for this CD and recorded them. And one of them was Secret Alchemy, and that's the title of the CD. the Rome Prize in 2000 to 2001. Was that the same prize that Hector Berlioz won? It's a bit different in that it's the American Rome Prize. It's similar that you get to go to Rome and spend a good chunk of time living and writing music in Rome. Hector Berlioz's and other French composers was the Prix de Rome from France. Each country has their own sort of academy in Rome. There's an American Academy, there's a Spanish Academy, there's a French Academy. So if you win the French Prix de Rome, you go and stay at the French Academy. And when the American Prix de Rome, it's at the American Academy in Rome. And you spend a year there with other artists in other fields. That's what makes it so fascinating. It's really an artist colony where at any one time, there are at least a couple of composers, there are architects classicists, landscape architects, poets, writers, painters, visual artists, and they're all living together at the American Academy and discovering Rome together, which made for an incredible year. This was one of the first years that they actually allowed children at the Academy. My wife and I went with our four-year-old and six-month-old and dragged him around Rome for a year. That was quite the learning experience. The young one didn't really remember anything from it, but the older one certainly did. And we brought them back as they got older. Every few years, we would try to go back so that they could build some memories for themselves too. And they loved it. Speaking of being a child, you talk about when you were young and you were writing, you would memorize the piece in your head and then write it down. And I'm always fascinated at the compositional process because 300 years ago, Composers would just play and it would never be written down. We probably missed most of the greatest music ever written. Recently, I saw a sketch of yours. It was really cool because it reminded me a little bit of when I'm doing the opposite, I'm putting music in my head as a conductor. It reminded me of what it looks like to me in my head to be able to reference it. Can you talk about how your process evolved from when you were young to what you're doing now to creating this beautiful, essentially artwork? which is a sketch of your compositions. And do you also do that with all of your pieces now? It's really evolved over the years. As one gets older, I think you form your own habits in the way you compose. So when I was young, as I said, I started as a pianist and I would work on a piece for six months to a year in terms of improvising and working through it was a composition process, but it was really just all played at the keyboard mm -hmm. as I was working through it. 
until I had a piece. And it was only then, after I had it memorized and I knew what I wanted it to be, that I would go ahead and write it down. That's not necessarily the most efficient way to work. <laughs> so later on, I developed a shorthand and outlining process that I share with my own students of starting with short little musical ideas, having a large scale architecture in some form fairly early on, and then not writing left to right. That's the hardest thing to do. Hmm. But working on different sections of a piece at different times as musical building blocks and then putting them together and really having from fairly early on in the process, as if you're an observer sort of overlooking the whole piece and observing what needs to be worked on throughout the process until you have a finished product. It's changed a lot over the years. I remember as a student, I was having trouble getting through a score, the Debussy Prelude to the Afternoon of Fawn. And my teacher at the time, she said, why don't you start with the end and work your way backwards? And that was the best advice I could have ever gotten because we think of music a lot of times temporally, right? We think, okay, it has a start, it has to have a middle, it has to have an end. But like you said, and we know from sketchbooks of other composers, that's not always how composition and stories are created. You start with the end or you say, I want to express this theme and how do we build around that? Once you have some material, you know how the piece is going to end, then it's a lot easier to know how to get there. You have somewhere mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. If it's completely open, that can sometimes be challenging. But there are many ways to go about it. And it's all quite fascinating in terms of how the human brain works and creativity. So are your sketches like the plans to the Death Star? If somebody who was separate from you saw them, somebody maybe not knowing you as a professor, could they discern your true meaning or the depth of what you're trying to express by looking at those? Or are they quite complex? They would be complete hieroglyphics to most people. There are pitches on the page and contours and notes, but my initial sketches are not, I mean, it doesn't even have staves. There'll be pitches and note names along the way. But it would be very difficult for someone to figure out what was going on. It's mainly like a shorthand, like I said. They're sort of rhythmic and contour sketches so that you can get a lot of ideas down quickly and then fairly early in the process start refining things right away. For me, with us, and I think that's true for many composers, just staring at a staff is very intimidating and <laughs> you want to write in all of the details right away, right? And by doing that, after hours of work, you might come up with three measures of music and it's five seconds. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then you, you figure, I guess I have a lot more to go. It's a sculptor chipping away at the rock little by little to eventually have the final object emerge. You have some incredible music for soloists with orchestra, two pieces that I'd like to ask you about in terms of collaboration. For the violin concerto, you collaborated with Margaret Bader, and then from Dust Till Starry Night, the mezzo-soprano Sasha Cook. Can you talk about that process? How do you discover soloists? How do you decide to write for soloists? And what kind of feedback loop is going on throughout the compositional process that affects the final product? Yeah, I love writing for soloists because for one, if they're working with orchestra, generally you're working with the soloists months and months ahead of time before the premiere. I also like sending them sketches of what I'm working on 
and they will give me comments and questions and sometimes possibilities for other types of things. It's very much collaborative and I love that process. And so they come in to the first orchestra rehearsal completely prepared. So you have a musician up there on stage with the other musicians who are leading the way and it really makes a big difference. With the violin concerto, it was so wonderful because even before the first rehearsal, we got together with the violin, solo violin and piano. I was playing the orchestra part on piano. And then we'd invite the conductor in just before the first rehearsal, just to go through it, the three of us. And then you have everybody knows the piece intimately before we even start the first rehearsal with just the bare bones orchestra piece. That doesn't always happen. Of course, the conductor is going to know the piece before they go in, but the orchestra is discovering it in the first rehearsal for the first time. But if you have a soloist sort of leading the way, it always makes a huge difference. As long as we're talking about collaboration, you've worked with a lot of orchestras and a lot of conductors, and you talked about how you would learn existing pieces and be composing as you go and improvising on them. And of course, the amazing Larry Ratcliffe, who's at Rice University, who just passed away, one of the people who inspired me the most in my life, he used to talk about compose as you go, even if we're doing something by Berlioz or Beethoven or Brahms. You have to be the composer to create the spontaneity and the spark that lights the fire and inspires the orchestra and the audience. And I would just love to hear your experiences working with him as a collaborator, as a mentor, as a friend and colleague at Rice in that regard. Larry was just such a huge force here at Rice and throughout the music world, a great loss. Just his ability to bring out in a score all of the details and all of the energy Larry and I had a long history. I went back to my high school days when I played some of these percussion instruments. I first met him at an Allstate festival in Vermont. He was conducting the Allstate band and I was playing percussion and I was playing <laughs> this metal plate part, which was just extremely loud. <laughs> uh, and anyway, we always used to joke about that as the first place we met. And then when I was an undergraduate studying piano and composition at Oberlin, he was conducting the contemporary ensemble there. Huh. So we all of this really great contemporary music, had visiting composers come in and work through rehearsals with us. Larry conducted one of my pieces there too with the contemporary ensemble, which was amazing. The most recent thing we did together was for the Rice Centennial, the orchestra commissioned all of the faculty composers to write a piece for the orchestra. Larry and I worked together on my piece, and it's one of the pieces that the orchestra took on tour to Carnegie Hall. And that was an amazing experience too. He always had a knack for just bringing out the best in the students. And like you said, giving it the energy and spirit of freshness always, <laughs> as if you're the composer and you make it your own. What a great loss. But his influence is felt throughout, not just here, just throughout the music world of all of the young conductors out there now in the world who are doing amazing things and all the musicians that he touched. I worked with him a lot with the repertoire of the classics, right? As you're learning, you usually just get stuck in running the contemporary ensemble and figuring it out yourself. Could you talk about maybe just for our listeners, and since I didn't see him do much contemporary music because of the nature of my relationship with him, can you talk about his approach to bringing those things to life and maybe in the context of the role a conductor can play in terms of premiering new music and in terms of your relationship with a conductor as a composer and any kind of nuggets of wisdom you have in that regard. Yeah, he was great at it. And the thing is, he did the ensemble at Oberlin for many years. And I think after that, he got more into the orchestral 
world. But in terms of contemporary music, Larry was a percussionist and his sense of rhythm and tempo and really, like I said, energy, bringing out the energy in the ensemble was just impeccable. And I think his training as a percussionist lent a lot to that and made him so great at doing all of this contemporary music. One of the things I remember getting back a score of mine that Larry had conducted and had all these long <laughs> phrase markings and things like he had analyzed the whole piece, things I didn't even know was in there <laughs> where it, it was eye opening to me what he was bringing out in the ensemble in terms of rehearsal. He was just the most amazing and efficient rehearser I've ever mm -hmm. seen. It's mm -hmm. just, he knew exactly yeah. what to do and how to do it and how to get the orchestra to play it, especially with contemporary music. That's rare that a conductor will know what to do because it's brand new to everybody. He presented so many different composers over the years. And I think it was his vision that not only could he present those new pieces with certain energy and freshness, but he brought those same kind of characters to the classics and made them sound new, made them sound yeah. fresh. Yeah. yeah. And I think that the world was touched, the music was touched and influenced and forever will be by his presence, Larry, if you're listening. The last thing that I think just was, to me, mind-blowing of his style is the humor that he brought to it, the sort of entertainment aspect, because it's so hard to be up there. You have so many things to do, and it's such a sort of advanced art form that doesn't really have a specific path to getting better at it, aside from maybe doing it. But just his ability to make people laugh. One of the memories that just came to me when I went to see him conduct in Utah once, and it was with the soloist Robert Levin, who writes his own solos. And he was in the midst of the cadenza. The pianist Robert Levin composed himself and was composing as was improvising. Coming out of the cadenza, of course, is the place where the orchestra needs the conductor. And I've never seen a conductor do a fake entrance before. He faked the orchestra out, making them think this is where it's going to be. And then, of course, it wasn't. And no conductor could get away with that. <laughs> or Robert decided he was about to end then, no, I think I'll do a little more. Yeah, yeah. Of course, he played along with it. But Speaking of Mozart, I remember shortly after I arrived at Rice in the late 90s, I remember seeing Larry conduct a Mozart symphony. And he was conducting it as in four, just a normal four. And then all of a sudden, he went into sort of half time and... That particular section, or it wasn't a long stretch, that particular stretch of music, it was moving in exactly that way. Mm -hmm. So you could just watch him in a way, and he was not only feeding the orchestra the music, but also the audience. And you just got more out of just watching him present the music. I always remember being really blown away by that. It's amazing how just incredible and inspirational and otherworldly this music already is, how much certain people like Larry can take it even to the next level. Even something like Mozart, as divine as that is. I really appreciate you sharing your memories of Larry. It's so heartwarming and comforting just to speak about him and think about him. I wanted to move to another collaboration that is very local for you, the album that we're focusing on today, Moonstrike. Your collaboration with Apollo Chamber Players, their founder and executive director, Matt Dietrich, a friend of the show, I interviewed him a ways back. Every album they put out is really genre bending and strikes curiosity and I think can speak to people who are not into classical music, which is what I'm always looking for. But I would love if you could talk about that collaboration and the Chanson de Lisette and the Cantique and the Fiddle Dance, these three incredible pieces that you've put together. I'd love if you could talk about that collaboration and maybe just a little bit about those movements. Sure. So the collaboration, I think it started when they asked me for a piece. And like you said, they're a very genre bending kind of group. They do a lot of different things. But one of the things they do so well is incorporate folk music into sort of the classical idiom. And so many classical pieces do that as well. 
But in my own piece, I wanted to explore my own roots in French Canadian folk music. So that's where I started with the piece and actually did a couple trips up to Quebec City, just listening to some of the street musicians. It's all over there in the summer anyway. And also listen to some of these old field recordings from the 1940s of just regular folks. These were not professional musicians' recordings. These were just field recordings of regular folks singing or playing an instrument, but all French-Canadian folk tunes, whether well-known or not. Most of them are not that well-known, but they are folk songs. And one of them was a kind of religious folk song that you hear at the very beginning of the Cantique movement. Cantique is just the French for canticle, which connotes a liturgical music. It's just a woman singing this sort of haunting modal melodic line about the passion, something that could be used in a church somewhere. So I decided to use that as the basis for the canticle, the second movement. The Chanson de Lisette was another fiddle folk tune that I heard, and that became the theme for the basis of a set of variations in the first movement. So you hear the theme at towards the beginning of the movement, and then it really moves into more contemporary language. The idea of this whole piece is combining traditional French Canadian folk tunes with my own contemporary musical language. The third movement, which is called fiddle dance, is based on French Canadian fiddling. And it sounds more folk based than the other two movements, but there's some actual fiddle music in there too. That was the three movements. The collaboration was wonderful. We got together after I'd written it here in Houston for quite a few rehearsals. They've played it around quite a bit, and I'm so glad they were able to record it for the CD. It's been a great and fruitful collaboration. Can you talk about the difference between collaborating with a chamber group? Because this is Apollo Chamber Players, very much a chamber group. You've also got your quintet, for instance, and a lot of other amazing chamber music. How that compares to a larger ensemble, maybe from a young composer standpoint, but also for a general audience standpoint. First, chamber music versus large ensemble or orchestral music. Totally different. Night and day. <laughs> Why? Why is that? First of all, a chamber group, if it's a formed group like the Apollo Chamber Players, they get together all the time to rehearse. They're constantly rehearsing together. Not that orchestras don't, but they have all the time in the world as a chamber group to a certain degree. They can rehearse as much as they want. And you can have very personal interactions in rehearsal because it's such a small group. The orchestra world has all of these built-in traditions. Basically, even for a premiere, they start rehearsing your piece maybe three days before the concert. So right there, it's totally different from a chamber group. It sounds so obscene the way you describe it. <laughs> Very different. So your piece better have no mistakes in the mm -hmm. part. Otherwise, you waste precious rehearsal time fixing mistakes. The conductor is basically trying to convey to the orchestra the composer's vision. And if the composer is at the rehearsal, the conductor can turn once in a while, but you don't want there to be too much talking during rehearsal because that rehearsal time is precious. Mm -hmm. And usually for the new piece, there's not going to be a lot of it. You got to make full use of that rehearsal time. And then after rehearsal is also very important because that's when the composer and the conductor get together and talk about how things went and how things might be different in the next rehearsal, things you might want to change. When you're trying to steer an 80-person ensemble or just writing for an 80-person ensemble, it's just a different beast than writing for mm -hmm. three or four people. Moving that whole ensemble together in the same direction is just much more challenging. So that time in between rehearsals for the composer and the conductor is really important as well. It's just a totally different experience. I love both of them. 
it's just different. Does anything still surprise you when you send the score to the orchestra at that first rehearsal of a premiere? Have you gotten surprised in the past or do you usually just expect what you're going to hear and you hear that? As a composer, you try to predict as much as possible what you're going to hear, but there are always some surprises. They say the composer should never attend the first rehearsal <laughs> <laughs> for an orchestra anyway, but we do all the yeah. time, of course. Yeah. It's just because the players are just getting to know the piece. They might have learned their part, of course. It's a premiere. No one's ever heard the piece before. And so they're not sure how their part is going to fit in with all of the other 75 instrumentalists playing too. So it's a much more complex kind of puzzle. There are always surprises and issues, especially with balance, even from hall to hall and orchestra to orchestra. You have to make provisions for changing balances because it's going to be different in different spaces and with different orchestras. Those are always issues with the first two rehearsals. How much are you writing a premiere for that specific audience? It seems like in the concert hall now, there's more of a penchant for something that people can leave the concert hall humming a tune or something. Do you think about the audience tastes or any kind of cultural developments in your compositions sure. or your teaching? I try to put myself actually in the audience's perspective when I'm first working on a piece. I imagine myself sitting in the hall and asking, hmm. okay, what am I hearing and what am I seeing on hmm. stage? You can't really write specifically for a general audience because there are so many different people with different tastes in the audience, but I certainly take that perspective into consideration when I'm writing. The people I'm writing for, the musicians I'm writing for, especially if it's a concerto or even a duo, a sonata or something, knowing the musician and the personality of the musician always has an influence on the piece. And that way, who are you writing for in terms of the musician and what kinds of things do they do and do they like to do and what are their preferences? I try to take that into consideration too. There's all these things that go into a piece. Sometimes the commissioner will ask you to write a certain piece based on a certain idea, or we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of this, or this piece is to commemorate the opening of this. So what kind of piece should it be? Usually commissioners leave the music fairly open to the composer because they want to get a piece that the composer wants to write. Are there instances where the music that it's going to be put up against or on the same program as, and does that ever influence you? The Cincinnati Symphony did a Beethoven project where they were performing because it was a Beethoven sesquicentennial year mm -hmm. and they were performing all of the Beethoven symphonies and for each symphony were commissioning a composer to write a kind of response, mm -hmm. a 21st cool. century response to the uh -huh. symphony, which is very challenging sometimes. <laughs> Why can't I just write what I want to write, but all the composers, I think, did write what they wanted to write, mm -hmm. but taking that into consideration. And so my symphony was Beethoven four, which I love. It's a, yeah. such a great piece. So it's more about certain technical aspects of the piece. My piece, no one's going to mistake it for Beethoven. And it's certainly not in that style whatsoever. It's very much a 21st century style, but some of the architecture of the piece and some of the gestural things in the piece are very much related to Beethoven and specifically that symphony. So sometimes you get requests like that where you're asked to consider certain options or certain ideas within your piece.
how did they present that? And what was the audience response? Because when we think of Beethoven, it's okay, now everybody loves it. But when these pieces were first being played, most, including many of the musicians, didn't understand it. Is there that kind of air of we have to maybe play this a few more times to understand it? Or how does this compare and contrast to Beethoven's symphonies? It's always a balancing act. It has to be straightforward enough to be able to get it or get some of it on one hearing, but it should be rich enough that you can hear it a second or third time and learn more and more about the piece. That's what makes the classics so rich is that you can go back to them again and still learn things. I loved the concert that we did with this piece. So they were going to do my piece on the first half, present it first, and then a concerto, and then second half was Beethoven 4. But after playing my piece in rehearsals, when the piece had a loud, big ending, the musicians approached the conductor and said, since this is a response to Beethoven 4, it would make more sense to put the Beethoven first and then this piece last. And he agreed and, okay, they're going to do this. And that kind of freaked me out <laughs> because <laughs> most of the audience is there to hear Beethoven and the concerto soloists. I didn't want half the audience to walk out at the last piece. But to their credit, everybody stayed and it was a big success. It shows if you have interesting programming, it can work. And what's the name of the piece that played with Beethoven for? The piece is called Passage for Orchestra. And it's basically based on different passages of, and also some of the architecture of Beethoven's Fourth Symphony. It's perfect because the Fourth and the Sixth Symphony don't have this kind of monster ending like some of the other ones do. It sounds perfect to come out of the fourth with something. I'm looking forward to checking that piece out. Pierre, it's been wonderful to speak with you. I've enjoyed learning about you as a composer and a teacher and really enjoyed listening to your music. And I'm looking forward to hopefully programming some in the future. Thank you for joining me on One Symphony today. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you for joining us on One Symphony. Thanks to Pierre Jalbert for sharing his music and stories. You can find more info at www.pierrejalbert.com. That's J-A-L-B-E-R-T. Pierre Jalbert composed all music featured in this episode, with one exception. String Theory was performed live by the Kaleidoscope Chamber Orchestra. Mystical and with great energy from Secret Alchemy from the album Music from Copeland House was performed by Curtis Maycomber, Danielle Farina, Alex Pia Gerlach, and Michael Bariskin. The first movement from From Dusk to Starry Night, The Night in Silence, on a text by Walt Whitman, features Sasha Cook and the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra. The Violin Concerto features Stephen Copes on violin and is performed by the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra with Thomas Zetmer as the conductor. Fiddle Dance is from L'Esprit du Nord, performed by the Apollo Chamber Players. Mozart's Piano Concerto K488 in A Major, the first movement with an improvised cadenza, was performed by Robert Levin, and the Kluge Nakopa Philharmonic in Romania with Nicole Moldovenau as the conductor. Chanson de Lisette from L'Esprit du Nord was performed by the Apollo Chamber Players. Music of Air and Fire was performed by Houston Youth Symphony, conducted by Michael Isidore. You can always find more info at onesymphony.org, including a virtual tip jar if you'd like to support the show. Please feel free to rate, review, and share the show. Until next time, thank you for being a part of the music.